Hola amigos, welcome to the third chapter in this Substance Designer course. In today's video, we're going to see how input maps work with the Tile Sampler node. Later on, we'll use them to produce a variety of natural scattering effects. Here, I'm making a quick hexagonal grid to illustrate the usage of the different input maps. If you need help with this step, I'll refer you to my previous video, where I cover all about this type of patterns. Next, I'll add a Gaussian noise set to a low scale and connect it to the input maps on the tile sampler. I also added a levels node to increase the contrast. That will make it easier to see the effects of these inputs. Let's start with the size. If I set the scale map multiplier all the way to 1, we can see that the scale of each instance is sampled from the input map and it matches the 2D preview below. Note that this acts as a multiplier, so the scale of each hex doesn't go past the original maximum. Next, we have the displacement map. This input will move each instance a different amount on the direction specified below. While this can be a very useful effect, it is very easy to run into clipping issues. Before I talk about rotation maps, Note that you cannot connect a grayscale node to the vector map, since it requires a color input. We'll see more about this in the next video, where we will use it to add directionality to our patterns. Rotation is pretty self-explanatory, although it is important to remember that the center of rotation is the center of the image input, which sometimes might not be the center of your shape. The color section uses a couple of input maps. The mask map threshold controls where can instances be created. This number sets the minimum value of the input map that would be a valid location for an instance. In our case, the bright areas of the Gaussian noise. The invert button below can be used to reverse the map, which causes instances only appearing on the dark areas of the input. We'll demonstrate the different sampling techniques later, but in essence, they control if the input shapes check for valid spots for just the center or the entire bounding box. There are also a few options for color parameterization. These change the color of each instance based on a given parameter, but since I'm showing input maps, I'll leave it on color input for now. Since this is our height map, once I set the multiplier to 1, it creates this kind of cool looking hexagonal terrain effect. I lower the global opacity to better show the background input and the different blending options. With the add sub mode, each hex is a flat value added to the background. The result is similar to the effect I showed before, except that here you can see how the hex's tops curve along the terrain instead of maintaining a flat top. On the other hand, while using the max mode, only the highest value between the hexagons and the background is used. Finally, let me remove the background and add a second shape to show the last map input. Setting the mode to distribution map will make it so the node chooses one of the available shapes based on equally distributed threshold values. In the case of two shapes, each one will appear only on half of the values of the histogram. Afterwards, this can be fine-tuned adjusting the sliders on the Levels node. Let's create a simple rock utility node to add to our library and use it to put all of this info together. We don't need much detail, so we'll make a set of four rocks at once. Start with a tile sampler node and set the pattern to paraboloid and the amount to 2 in both axes. Now, give them a bit of a noble shape by reducing the x or y sizes and a random rotation. Next, we'll make their shapes more interesting by adding a warp node, using a purling noise as input. Adjust the scale of the noise and the intensity of the warp until you get some variation that you like.
Now, we'll add some surface detail with a Cells 1 node and blend it with a medium opacity subtract. This type of simple bumpy noise can be useful to make stylized rocks like these ones. Similar to what we did in the previous video, we will create a mask using a histogram scan set to one position, one contrast, followed by a float fill and two float fill to gradient. Set the angle variation to 1 in both of these, but give them different random seed values. Now blend those back into the base shapes using the mean darken mode. This will add a couple of random angle cuts to our rocks. To get the individual output for each one of the rocks, first add a transform 2D node. To be precise with the next operations, click the button that says Edit Matrix Values. This will display the transform matrix for our texture. Set both X1 and Y2 values to 0.5 to scale it 100% on each axis, and set the offsets to minus 0.25. Now that we have one of the rocks isolated, all we have to do is duplicate this transform three times with Ctrl plus D, and then change the signs of the offsets on each one of the copies. Since the first one was minus minus, set the other ones to the following, plus plus, plus minus, and minus plus. The final step is to add one output node to each one of the transforms. After that, we can select all these nodes, right-click on any of them, and create a graph from this selection. Watch the previous video to see how to add this to the shared library if you need to. Let's see how to put all this information together with some simple examples. The first one will start with the rock utility node that we just made. Then Add a tile sampler after it. The first thing we need to change on this is the pattern and set it to pattern input. Increase the input number to 4 and connect each one of the rock outputs to one of them. This doesn't look great, but there are a few parameters that we can tweak to make it appear more natural. Set the amount on each axis to a large number, 30 or 35, and the offset to 0.5. This will be a good starting point to introduce some randomness. Adjust the random position next, set it to something like 0.3 or 0.2. The offset will help in making it look chaotic even with these low values. Set the scale to a larger value, like 5 or 6, and increase the random Y size to have some longer looking rocks. Then, add a low scale Gaussian noise and connect it to the scale map input. To see the effect of this noise, increase the scale map multiplier all the way to 1. I also increase the random rotation to have even more variety. The first change in the color section will be changing the color parameterization to scale and setting its multiplier to 1. This will change the output color based on the scale of each instance, making the smaller rocks also lower in height. Increase the value of the mask random parameter as well, to remove about half of the rocks. This will also solve most of the remaining clipping. This looks a lot better now. You can spend some time fine-tuning the parameters, change the random seeds of the rocks, or the tile sampler, or changing the distribution shape. For example, I can replace the Gaussian noise for a paraboloid or other round shape and create this cool looking mound. The Levels node can be used to control the size and flatness of the pile. Let's see now how we can stack these rock layers. I skipped a couple steps, but I basically changed the amount, scale and mask random to get only a few large rocks. When layering objects, it's a good practice to go from largest to smallest shapes and from bottom to top. Add an auto levels node as well to get the full grayscale range back. 
Now we can duplicate this tile sampler and its inputs, change the random seeds and blend them together using the additive mode. Next, tweak the parameters of this second tile sampler until you get something similar to the starting point of the previous example. Feel free to follow along the video and use the same values as me. To place these small rocks only on empty space, we need to generate a mask from the larger rocks. We'll do that using a histogram scan node. Set both its position and contrast to 1. We will need to go back to this value later to adjust it anyway. Connect this to the mask map input and in the tile sampler increase the threshold to a medium value. We want the rocks to appear on the black areas of the mask, so we will have to be inverted. After doing so, we can see that some of the smaller rocks are still on top of the larger ones. To fix this, you can either change the sampling technique to bounding box, go back to the histogram scan and change the position value, or, as I've shown here, a combination of both. Add now an ambient occlusion node after the histogram scan and connect it to the scale map input. If you have the scan selected when adding the node, it will be connected to the mask map input instead, so be careful. The ambient occlusion generates these soft shadows around the rocks. In our case, we're going to use these gradients to drive the scale of the small ones, so we need to invert it as well so they go from white to black. Since the scale map doesn't have an invert button on the tile sampler, you will need to add an invert grayscale node as well. After doing this and increasing the scale map multiplier, if you select the ambient occlusion node, you can use the height, depth and radius parameters to control how far their small rocks spread from the larger ones and how sharply they decrease in size. Here I realized that I had some color random, so the color parameterization was a bit messed up. Remember to set it to a scale to make the smaller rocks darker and lower. The ambient occlusion node is very useful to generate uniform distributions around objects but sometimes you might need to add some directionality to them. For example, in a slope or for impact debris. In those cases, we can use a shadows node, add one and also an invert grayscale node, and connect those to the scale map input, replacing the connection from earlier. Back to the shadows node, the shadow distance parameter controls how far the small rocks spread, the edge softness, how sharply it decreases in size, and the light angle sets their direction. We can always keep adding more layers of smaller and smaller rocks, duplicating these nodes, changing their seeds, and making new masks from the previous blends. Then, using flood fields, we can give them different colors and then use a height blend to combine them with a base ground dirt, like we saw in the previous video. And that's all I have for today's video. If you stayed until the end, thank you for watching. In the next lesson, we'll make another utility node and then combine all we've learned so far to make a more complex cobblestone material. See you next time!